to have only one in the whole family. So as an overview for tonight, uh, on my presentation anyway, uh, we'll try and answer some of the questions about why do we seem to be getting so many blasted diseases and insect problems coming in from Asia? And the short answer is we're not. Uh, they're getting as many or more from us. So this is part of the global trade that we'll be referring to. Uh, how much diversity is adequate? Uh, and that's what I'll be talking about first off. And then uh, I'll list, uh, you know, give you a, a short list of uh, some of the disease and insect tolerant species and the, the characteristics of those. So uh, the 10, 20, 30 percent rule was uh, is being credited to Frank Santamore, the late uh, Dr. Frank Santamore, who was a geneticist with the uh, National Arboretum, I believe it was, that he was. And he uh, published this in the, um, in a, uh, as a proscenium for a, you know, a talk that he gave on entitled Trees for Urban Planning's Diversity, Uniformity, and Common Sense. And Frank was a, a great fellow. And before he passed away, he said, you know, I think that 10, 20, 30 percent is a little bit high. Uh, so he would have made it, um, if he had uh, lived um, longer, he would have uh, probably made it 10% of a genus. And this is a good rule of thumb to deal with. Now, as we look at uh, the history, uh, we had the American chestnut blight that uh, came in uh, uh, about 1904 from Asia to North America. And it certainly decimated 25% of the canopy cover in the Appalachian chain. Then we had a uh, Dutch elm disease. It's thought to have come in in 1819 in, from Asia into Europe. It may have been in Europe before that time, but it came into North America, we know from uh, good railroad records of on a load of logs of English elm that came in and it uh, came in uh, to the uh, Cleveland area in about 1928. There was another race of the disease that came in in the 1940s and another, a third race of the disease that came into the uh, uh, North America in the 1960s, sometime in there. And everybody is uh, familiar with the emerald ash borer and the Asian longhorn beetle. These are two that have, uh, you know, had a major uh, impact on uh, Ohio and Kentucky and and uh, Indiana. And so we really are, are concerned about those and trying to contain them uh, as best we're able. And we've got the also rans. And I've got a long list of those right down at the bottom. The gypsy moth, the Asian gypsy moth, which is not here, is up in uh, uh, the Pacific Northwest. The murder hornet, hornet which has been in the uh, news and the list goes on and on. And you can read those. And as we look at that list, uh, the whole group of them here, and this is just a few of the insects and diseases. It does not include any of the invasive species of plants like kudzu and the bush honeysuckle, et cetera. But most of these have come in from Asia as well as from Europe. So that is the commonality that all of them have is uh, from Asia and Europe not so much from South America and uh, Africa and India and other Australia. Uh, so what is the commonality? What is the reason for that? You have to go back in time and look at a little bit of geologic history uh, of what the earth looked like uh, between 425 million years ago and 200 million years ago. We were on a supercontinent called Laurasia which was made up and that, that name came from the St. Lawrence Seaway and Asia. It was made up of North America, Europe, and Asia, and also had Greenland, but we don't have too many plants anymore from Greenland. Uh, Greenland was once a much warmer climate. The other supercontinent was called Ganwada, a uh, name that came from a province in uh, India, and it was made of South America, Africa, India, Australia, and then again, Antarctica, where we do not have too many plants uh, today. Uh, we're 
you know, the people that deal with Antarctica are really trying to keep some of the other invasives like Kentucky bluegrass out of Antarctica. So this is, these are the two major continents, Laurasia and Gondwana. And if you look at not only the plants, but also the animals, uh, they're all very, very similar. And so uh, that is part of the, uh, the key right there. Now, this is the geologic uh, periodic tape table, uh, the timetable. And if you look at this on your screen, uh, what you see is the Holocene. And that is the period that we are either current in, currently in, or actually going out of. Uh, they have uh, proposed a new uh, epoch uh, called the uh, Anthropocene, which is the time of man. Uh, but if you look on the right hand side of the chart, there, there are four dots there. The first dot, the highest dot up there on the chart is 10,000 years ago. Now, the, as you look at this, do keep in mind that this is not to scale. So that dot that's right below that was about 250 million years ago, uh, 250,000 years ago. That's when we as a species uh, began to develop, when Homo sapiens uh, is, uh, really began to become a unique group of uh, animals. Uh, then if you look at the third dot down, that was 65 million years ago. That's when the dinosaurs looked up in the sky and saw this big rock coming down at them and said, oh, hell, uh, it's going to be a bad day for us. Uh, or some of them probably said, you know, this probably isn't, isn't a real rock coming down out of the sky. Uh, then if you look down at the fourth dot down there, that is uh, from 290 million years ago to 354 million years ago. This is the Carbonaceous period uh, subdivided into the Mississippian period and the Pennsylvanian period. This is when all of the coal in um, Indiana and Kentucky and Ohio, and West Virginia and Pennsylvania uh, was formed. It's also uh, the time period when the lignin digesting fungi, which we know as the white rots, were evolving. So I remember uh, a teacher in elementary school saying the coal is being formed, but it's so slowly uh, that we'll use up all of the coal before uh, any of it is uh, is remade again. Now that the Pennsylvanian period and the Mississippian period together were as long a time as it has been since the dinosaurs went extinct, 65 million years or thereabouts. Uh, so that was a long, long time period. And at the end of that, the, the white rots or the lignin digesting fungi ensured that there would not be these massive buildups of, um, of wood out in the uh, area. Now, the area between the two arrows that I've got that sort of bracket the, uh, the carbonaceous period, that is the Silurian and the Triassic period of or between those two periods. And it um, is the time when the flowering plants were evolving. There were tree ferns before that. This is also when the insects uh, that uh, Joe Boggs will be talking about were beginning to evolve. Now, the insects uh, co-evolved with the flowering plants. The flowering plants benefited from the pollinators and then the pollinators, the insects that were pollinating it, uh, also began to uh, uh, benefit uh, from the, the pollen and the nectar uh, that were being produced by the flowering plants. So that's called co-evolution. And all of these plants were beginning to evolve on the two continents, Laurasia, and on uh, Gondwana. And as we look at that list, here is a list, and this is part of the list, of uh, some of the plants that developed on Laurasia. And we recognize all of these as very common garden plants. I won't read through all of these, but the, in case you're uh, listening in on a phone and not able to see the actual screen, uh, just to give you a quick uh, rundown on this, these are the firs, the maples, the service berries, the birches, hornbeams, hickories, chestnut, dogwood, chestnut, um, 
Um, I've got Castina down there twice. I didn't notice that until just then. But the beech and the ash and walnut and juniper larch, uh, and the list goes on and on and on. And as you look at these and the ones on the next screen, all of these are common to North America, to Europe, and to Asia. Uh, some of these, a few of these are found only on two of those continents, uh, Europe being the continent that has the, the fewest number of native species, uh, Kentucky, um, which I know a little bit more about than Ohio and Indiana, as far as the plant material, but Kentucky has more native species than all of Europe. And so the reason for that is the glaciers and the glaciers push the, uh, the plant material in uh, Europe down against the Alps and a lot of it went to extinct. So they had some chestnuts, they had hackberries there in Europe, but they did not uh, survive the glaciers. And so what co-evolved in uh, Europe and in Asia uh, the insects co-evolved with them, and that's why we see the ash tree, uh, which was on the uh, the previous uh, slide, um, you know, the fractionus on the right-hand side, second one down. Uh, the, the emerald ash borer co-evolved and lived happily with the ash tree. It attacked the ash trees over in Asia uh, that were under a great deal of stress, and it was the one that just quietly took these uh, plants out as they became overly stressed. And we see this with our lilac borer on some of our native ashes, uh, and some of the, the lilacs as well. So as we look at these, these are the plants where we have the greatest problems uh, with the potential of having an invasive species coming in and really decimating it like the ash did. Now my money uh, on a bet would have been on the, the uh, uh, red maple because we've overplanted that so much, but uh, that has not been a problem. Then we get into monotypic species. Now, not all of these are native to North America. Many of them are. Many of them are native to Europe. Many of them are native only to Asia. But these are species that have very few uh, relatives. Uh, the pawpaw is a good disease and insect-free tree or relatively insect-resistant tree. We've got the Kentucky coffee tree, which is a great urban tree. Caleopanex, which is on the right-hand side, second one down, the Castor aurelia, is native to Asia and is, the, is a one-of-a-kind, as is Coleraria, the golden rain tree. Now, I did not put Tree of Heaven on this list, but that could easily have been on the list too. It is a one of a kind, uh, so that they do not have many uh, members of that particular family. Most of our diseases and insects are going to be very host specific and are only going to attack one uh, uh, species within a genus or one genus within a family. And that's uh, fairly common for that. So here is the remainder of the list. Uh, I was told to keep it down to 15 minutes and I'm right about at my 15 minute period. So if uh, these are the list of uh, species that are monotypic, uh, these are in a publication. So if you will uh, Google after your ash has died, making an informed decision on what to replant, you'll get a copy of that popping up and you can put my name in there too, just Fountain or ID uh, 241. Or if you didn't get this, uh, you can send me an email and I'll be glad to either provide you with a copy of the PowerPoint or a copy of the uh, publication uh, for that. So my email address is bill.fountain at uky.edu. And so with that, I think I've used my 15 minutes. Uh, and in just closing, I'll say uh, the success in a landscape is to use a diversity of species. I've given a, a little bit of an overview on what I think, um, you know, are some guidelines for that. Uh, use uh, use uh, things that are relatively insect and disease resistant. It's very important to match the plant with the cultural conditions that it needs to, in order to uh, succeed and uh, to, 
that also will fill the, fulfill the design requirements. Okay. Bravo, Bill. I can't believe you held that to 15 minutes. Yes. Excellent presentation. Well, um, I guess I'll go ahead and get started. Um, we're, I'm self-moderating. I hope that's okay with everyone. But um, um, my presentation is kind of a good segue off of what Bill was talking about as far as um, what era we're in. And we are currently in the Holocene era. And now we've entered the anthropogenic era. Um, issues that we're faced with now and so what i'm going to do is uh, actually pre-recorded this uh, because i wasn't sh i thought i might not be able to make this tonight uh, due to my uh, health issues with my wife but we're going to move forward with this so um, i'll be monitoring the chat as well if there's any questions Hey, Lindsay, I'm not getting any sound on this. Lindsay, I'm I'm like others. I'm not getting sound with this. Can you if you can hear me? Huh. Uh, when you initiated it, did you do the thing where, you know, when you shared screen, did you do where you just as you share screen, it has two boxes to click and one says to share audio and video? Oh, yeah, I see that. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah just go all the way back. Uh, just I would exit out and come back in. No, I, I think you need to exit out. Just get all the way out, like stop sharing. Okay. And then when you come back in, when you share, as soon as you hit the share screen, you'll see there are two boxes right down below that talk about audio and video. Mm, okay. I apologize for that. Uh, That's all right. I thought I had that all taken care of there. How about now? Hi, my name is Lindsay Priscilla. I the hear you in stereo. Outstanding. University, uh, <laughs> located in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. I have an extension appointment here as well as a teaching appointment in the Urban Forestry Management Program. And today I'd like to talk a little bit about the sustainability perspectives on urban forestry. And I believe it's fair to say that nearly everyone is familiar with the concept of climate change. It is documented to have an impact pretty much everywhere on our planet. So what concerns does this present to tree owners, tree managers, arborists, horticulturalists, any tree advocate? Well, I think the question can be broken down into simpler terms as do we understand the impact on our urban canopy? And even more importantly, have we identified any solutions to that sustainability issue? I think we all realize that sustainable landscapes and tree canopy are critical to our quality of life and future of our cities and towns. So the focus of this perspective will be on some ideas of what I have relative to the question of what can we do. So believe it or not, we are experiencing changes in weather but more specifically climate. Climate and climate change influences our weather with longer droughts, higher temperatures, 
increased intensity and frequency of storms and this news is coming into our living rooms every day and it's it's really hard to deny it's having a major impact on our health but also our trees as well so i like to tell everybody hey welcome to the anthropocene so this is a new geologic epoch that scientists have determined where humans are the drivers of these rapidly changing global and local conditions and some of the pressures of this new epic, um, which affect all of us, include uh, basically a limitation of our natural resources. They're disappearing on a, a, an astounding basis on, on every day. Also, air and water pollution um, is one of the pressures that have we've welcomed into this new epic. And I'm, I'm particularly interested in this aspect um, in Indiana where, where I'm located and the fact that according to research we rank 46 out of the 50 states in air and water quality. And this is basically a degradation of important ecosystem services uh, that we so desperately need and need to maintain in our urban canopies. Climate change threatens every part of our biosphere by clearing of natural forests and natural ecosystems to the lack of our ability to maintain any type of urban canopy. So how does that translate for us and, and what can we do? Well, I'm going to briefly identify four things that I think we can do as people who care about our planet to help improve our urban forests. Now, first I want to start with basically identifying constraints. That's the first step. Regardless of the system that you're managing, whether it's a college campus or city trees or a residential landscape, there's constraints or limits that prohibit us from reaching our, our, our planning goals. Um, and typically they can be grouped or categorized into environmental or, and or physical limitations. I think it's important for us to, to identify also that water is most likely the single most limiting ecological factor impacting tree survival. A tree cannot survive without water and is a majority of the composition of the tree. So we need to identify constraints such as drought um, and water restrictions. And oftentimes those are brought about due to just the fact of the trees trying to grow in and around urban infrastructure, which includes impervious surfaces that affect um, water availability. Also soil conditions, the compacted soils that we often have to deal with and try to grow and, and, and allow trees to thrive. And of course, when we're talking about the built environment, we can't forget about these restrictive soil volumes or these planting vaults, these four by four by four, what I like to think of as burial vaults sometimes that we're trying to grow trees in. So we need to make sure that we identify those because that'll help determine our selection process and what we need to consider in, in those planting strategies. So when we're planning for trees for the future, I think we need to focus our, our priorities of selection based on what I've identified as the three major constraints. Um, the drought response of the tree, um, its susceptibility to pests, and also soil conditions, compaction, fragmentation, uh, poison, all, uh, soils, all of those things need, need to go, go into that selection process. Um, also, I think it's important that we get to the fundamentals of, of plant physiology. And, and what I'm talking about primarily is researching uh, tree hydrodynamics. And what that really is about is, is getting a better understanding of how the tree responds to uh, moisture stress and drought conditions. And this is really about um, whether they're tolerant of those conditions or try to avoid it. And they will respond according to how they're genetically um, designed to. Um, Dr. Andrew Hirons has come up with a, a book called Tree Species Selections for Green Infrastructure, which I think will be very instructive uh, for those people who are uh, choosing or selecting plants and developing planting strategies. So planning 
Planting trees for the future is one thing, but I'd like to say that we need to plan for trees with a future. And by better selection and better criteria in that process, I think we have a better chance of maintaining a longer lived urban canopy. So next I'd like to talk about needs rec recognition. We need to have planting strategies that meet social needs and, and as well as environmental needs. I think it's important that we identify those red line areas that affect planting strategies in many of our urban areas and have been so for decades and improve that convergence between canopy goals and economic development. In that process, we need to also make sure that we ensure community engagement as well as their endorsement um, and identify resource management that matches the resources and abilities of that particular location or area within your city or town. So that's going to be important as far as making sure our canopy goals are congruent with um, attrition and growth. Now, if you're not familiar with the practice of redlining, um, it legally ended back in the 70s, but the negative impacts have been around for, for decades. It was really, um, honestly, just an unethical practice that put financial and, and other services, including ecosystem services, out of reach for entire neighborhoods where people of color or, uh, or lower income live. So we can I often interpret where our trees are and where those red line districts were based on, on the age and health of, of our urban, urban canopy. So I think we need to identify those, recognize those, and then adjust our planting strategies accordingly. Next is sustainable landscapes. We certainly recognize that most of our trees struggle with the built environment. As I mentioned, identifying those constraints and, and climate change is just added to that list of impediments. Now, sustainable landscapes are responsive uh, to the environment if selected properly. Uh, they can be uh, considered regenerative and can actively contribute to the development of healthy communities by sequestering carbon, cleaning air, cleaning water, um, all of those ecosystem services, which is so important to us. But I think one of the most critical things that are um, not included in planting strategies and planning protocols is that of the establishment period and maintenance that is associated with keeping those trees alive. I really believe that one of the most important protocols to include in any planting strategy is that establishment period. Planning and, and identifying resources that are dedicated to that establishment period, those critical first two to three or maybe even four years of, of, of maintenance to try to get those trees established in their new environment and in their new home. And oftentimes, again, it's being realistic about the resources you have and accountable and responsible for that green asset so that it doesn't become a brown liability. So we, what we want to do is design for success in the planning and planting and not design for decline, which seems to be more consistent and more prevalent than, than I'd, like to, I'd like to admit. And then another tool that's available to us, um, which you may not be familiar with, um, is the stewardship mapping. And this is about identifying who's taking care of our trees um, and where they're at. Um, the stew map is designed to answer kind of who are the environmental stewardship groups who are caring for our urban landscapes. And, and this is a, a, a great guide for um, any organization who wants to kind of develop their own stewardship map in their own city. Very helpful, especially with that establishment protocol um, and also for identifying resources that are avail available to you in your community. Finally, my fourth one is safe spaces. Tree risk management should be an integral part of basically any community's overall risk management strategy and plan. Uh, safe spaces include uh, public landscapes, parks, and, and, and any natural areas that are, that are available to anyone. And 
In the midst of this pandemic, our natural resources have become increasingly more popular, more important, and in greater demand. So we want to make sure that we provide those safe spaces in every part of the community so that we have better ecosystem equity. So these are basically the four um, ideas that I've identified to improve sustainability of our urban forest during this climate crisis. And as urban foresters and arborists, our work really contributes to creating more ecological, sustainable communities. And so the, the question really becomes then to us is why do we need this? Well, it's pretty simple. It's about, it's about the benefits of trees. And we, we all know about those functional benefits. And the green industry and supporting organizations need to work harder at positioning themselves as a solution in the agenda. Um, there's ter tremendous opportunity for urban forestry activities to align with overall community goals and sustainability initiatives. initiatives. So the spotlight is now on us as stewards of our nat natural resources uh, to really make a difference. Uh, just some resources available to you. Some of what I talked about is available um, on our website, purdulandscapereport.org, um, and also on our Facebook page. This is a, a regular blog um, that uh, pre uh, presents timely information and current emerging issues and trends uh, regarding trees and, and our landscapes. Um, and then finally, I'd like to just say thank you uh, for the invitation to be a part of this uh, <laughs> rock star group of guys, um, Joe and Bill Fountain, uh, longtime friends and colleagues, and especially Chris Stone for um, including me in this program. So hopefully I've given you some ideas to think about as far as what you can do in your community to improve uh, the longevity, sustainability, and contribution of the trees in our urban forest. Uh, so I'd like to say thank you again and uh, stay safe and, and be well. Well, that was outstanding, Lindsay. <laughs> Hey, I'm glad you guys liked it. I could have talked for an hour on each one of those segments, but uh, in the interest of time and respect to my the guy who's closing this 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 rock star event, uh, Joe, um, it, it's all yours. <laughs> well, it may not be mine. I don't have sharing capabilities, so uh, uh oh, Chris is so Chris or Josh, if you could make me a co-host, that'd be outstanding, and we can keep this rolling. You're co-host now, buddy. By golly. You're good to I, go. I have the power. <laughs> You're like a Jedi warrior. <laughs> All right. So um, now let's bring this up. All right. Can everybody see my screen okay? I always have to ask. Yes. See, I see it. Outstanding. All You're right. Good, Joe. Well, my first and your point. your 15 minutes are up. <laughs> <laughs> my first point is I'd like to thank Chris. Of course, you know, we all want to get back outside. You know, this is at the, at the, everybody should recognize this is at the Arboretum and there's Chris taking us around on a diagnostic walkabout. And there's Bill in the same Arboretum. You know, there's, there's we can't wait for a vaccine, but you know, there is, uh, there's an upside though to COVID-19. It's the only upside. And that's what we're doing tonight. You know, online Zoom training, let's face it, 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 it has some benefits. First of all, there's no need to drive. I mean, this is the last time Bill and Lindsay and I drove down. It was a great trip, you know, and of course, sometimes Bill rides his motorcycle. So <laughs> this one, you know, and there's, there's no need to dress up. I mean, <laughs> hard telling what me and Lindsay and Bill are actually wearing, right? We won't talk about that. <laughs> So my second point is, uh, let's face it, there are too many pests and diseases to get through in 15 minutes. You know, I mean, that's just kind of how I felt when I was putting this together. But I'm going to get through some major ones, and I'm going to I'm going to cheat a little bit. Uh, what I have at my disposal is something that could serve as a handout. Every one of you, anyone listening, uh, can could even go there while we speak because. You know, we're all on computers, but the Buckeye Yard and Garden Line that we affectionately call the Biggle fetches timely factual information. So I'm actually going to be highlighting a, th a few things out of the Biggle in terms of talking about pests and diseases. 
and um, the first thing is I just want to point out, you can get this a number of different ways. You can visit our website. Uh, this is the uh, bygl.osu.edu, or you could just type Beagle. Uh, if you Googled Beagle, uh, it, it'll take you right to it. This is the current um, website. I mean, that I actually took this today. So you can see these are the different reports. So you could do it that way. And you may want to do that to review some of the things I've talked about and some of the things I haven't talked about. I think a much better way, though, to tap in to this constant source of information is to get it by what we call Beagle Alerts. If you sign up for the alerts, when we post an alert, which could be 24-7, seriously, over the weekend, sometimes you know, you'll see one pop out in an evening, uh, this is all that will show up in your email. It won't flood your email and you won't get big messages. You'll get the title of the report. You'll get a brief description. Brood 10 periodical cicadas will emerge in full force in 2021. But a few early risers are making an appearance this spring. And if you then click on this hot link, you'll get the alert. So this kind of brings up something. It's going to happen next spring. We're going to see one of the, actually the largest brood emergence in the United States. Brood 10 will emerge across 15 states, including all of Kentucky, Ohio, and Indiana. So it's going to be a big deal. We'll see these periodical. In this case, it took 17 years. There are some periodical cicadas that take 13. This is a 17-year form. And of course, this is when the new adults first emerged from the last instar nymphs exoskeleton that climbed the tree. And this, they just hadn't hardened off yet. They quickly mate. The females then use this very sharp ovipositor to jab eggs into the, into the stems. And this is what the oviposition marks look like. And here are the eggs lined up like little soldiers. Now, keep in mind, this insect co-evolved with our deciduous trees. It's primarily a deciduous tree pest. Occasionally you'll see conifers, but it's too sticky for them. So uh, they tend to be oaks, maples, deciduous trees. They co-evolve. They are not a tree killer. So the damage causes flagging on purpose. The idea is the cicadas hope by damaging the tips, just the twigs, that that twig will die and break off. And then when these eggs hatch, the little nymphs can just step right off into the soil where they spend 17 years. Otherwise, you know, if they hatch while well, they're up in the air, they just, they have to, you know, I guess little parachutes and who knows where they'll come down. The point being is by and large, they really do not cause any great harm. Although we are often a bit more concerned about newly planted trees. Spotted lantern has been in the news. My colleague, Amy Stone, and we kind of divide these up. Uh, Amy's based up in Lucas County, up in Toledo. Uh, she and I and a couple others work pretty hard on the non-native invasives. And so she's provided a lot of updates in the Beagle and for very good reason, because uh, just about uh, two weeks ago, it was confirmed that we do have a population in Eastern Ohio. Unfortunately, this insect is already too widespread for eradication, uh, but stay tuned. I mean, be uh, get Beagle alerts. I think you'll find we're not going to be dealing with quite the same challenge we had with thermal ash borer and certainly not the challenge that we could potentially have with Asian longhorn beetle. Asian longhorn beetle is a true tree killer and we do hope that it gets eradicated. We try to keep you up to date and alert on what's happening, including the most recent find in South Carolina and then webinars and training so you can uh, learn more about it. The Buckeye Yard and Garden Line, we really try to to provide a lot of different information. So to sign up for the alerts, just send a message to BeagleAlert at list.osu.edu. And then type in the subject line, subscribe to Beagle Alerts. Now we'll have your email address, but you could, you know, you could enter it in the message text or you could, uh, you know, sign up other people, people you don't even know, maybe just they'll be kind of fun, right? But the big point we think with the Beagle and other outlets of information is to recognize that even though we often focus on one problem, we also will sometimes focus on other problems that happen at the same time because we seldom have the luxury of just working with one pest or a disease at a time. 
if we look at this for uh, this American beach, for example, there's anthracnose, necrotic tissue from anthracnose at the same time as the iridium patches produced by an area of thiamide. mite. And then a few years ago, you also saw, saw physiological leaf scorch with these three things. So it's not unusual to have more than one thing. And of course, this season, I heard this early, you know, mid-season and last year we heard this, you know, what's wrong with all the oaks? Why are they looking so harsh? Well, it was a bit of a convergence of things. Nothing that I'm gonna talk about would harm the overall health of the trees. So don't paint with too broad a brush, but we did have oak anthracnose. This fungal disease really flourishes when we have cool, wet springs. And of course we had that this year. And it does, it does cause quite a bit of noticeable symptomology, but not enough to cause harm to the health of the tree typically. And, you know, it can make the leaves look very gnarled and, you know, not so good. But you look at, I mean, there's actually the major percentages of these, most of these leaves are still very functional. Most areas still functional. And the other thing about oak anthracnose, and in fact, this applies to a lot of the anthracnose diseases. Now we call them anthracnose, I should say that. That's not the fungal <clears throat> genus. Uh, that's not like verticillium wilt. Uh, so anthracnose is just called that, called that by the plant pathologist because of a set of symptoms that tends to go into this category. But you'll notice infections occur early in the season. So that means the growth early in the season is most affected. And then later trees can outgrow it. But here we have another issue. We have anthracnose, but what in the world are these strange holes that are staring at you? I mean, what is going on there? Well, that's caused by oak shot hole leaf miner, which is a tiny fly, a midge fly. Now you can see by this little uh, gif here, fly, this fly has lapping mouth parts. So what does it do to feed? Well, what it does is it uses a, a sharp ovipositor at the other end to poke holes into the, not leaves, but into the buds just before the leaves start unfurling and expanding. So you see these holes that often match across from each other because of that damage where this leaf was folded up before it unfurled. And it, it's a non-native, and I have to tell you, it is called leaf miner, by the way, because also the larvae uh, uh, feed as leaf miners. It's a non-native and it does seem like populations really are building, but here we have both anthracnose and shot hole leaf miner making this oak pr look pretty harsh. And this was taken very late in the season. The damage doesn't go away, but again, look how much the leaf is still functional. Is this a pest or a disease I'm showing you here? Well, as a matter of fact, it's, it's, it's both. On the left is a pest, uh, oak leaf blister mite, an area of on the right, is oak leaf blister, a fungus. And notice how they look, the symptoms look almost identical. So again, not just one thing. Oak leaf blister, again, we see a heavier uh, amount of infection. We've been seeing this a little bit here and there over the last two years, all well, this past season and the previous season, because each year we had record setting rainfall in the spring. But you see this blistering, and when you flip the leaves over, you'll see something a little different. What did I just do there to you? If you flip this leaf over, you'll just see a, 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 a just kind of a, I actually thought I had an image in here and should have, but you'll just, you, you'll see an empty pocket. It's an empty pocket. But flip this leaf over, and what do you see? This is not oak leaf blister. This is the area of thiamide. And so this furriness is indicating an entirely different problem. So holy oaks and ugly oaks, we covered that this past season. Bagworms, I'm, not gonna, I'm, I'm just gonna show some highlights based on big alerts. Uh, another native and because of mild winters, it does have a low temperature overwintering wintering threshold. And again, populations uh, are, are building back, you know, from the years where we had uh, the uh, Polar Express, you might say, coming down and, and uh, knocking temperatures down, also knocked bagworms down. We had a wonderful year, well, if you're an entomologist, for fall webworm, some spectacular nests. Mimosa webworm is kind of an old friend that's returned. Uh, mimosa webworm is another non-native. I'm going to spend just a few minutes on it. 
uh, because this past year we were starting to see some building populations. Once again, it does have a low temperature threshold and um, the Arctic vortexes that we experienced knocked it back a little bit. I am seeing it returning. So I wanna kind of uh, point this out and <laughs> emphasize it. So non-native introduced uh, from China in the 1940s. Now it was first reported as its namesake on Mimosa. And then in 1947, it was reported on honey locusts. Now the early research papers, those done back in the late 40s and early 50s, indicated that it preferred mimosa over honey locusts, but what kind of honey locusts? What were they dealing with? Well, they were looking at our native honey locusts, not the thornless honey locusts. We tend to forget, you know, the first time we had thornless honey locusts in 1949, and it was moraine produced by the Siebenthaler Company in uh, Dayton, Ohio, found, the tree was found. Actually, this is, uh, Lindsay, you uh, kind of appreciate this. It was Northwest Ohio, but it's actually found uh, by uh, uh, the Siebenthalers on the way to, um, to Michigan. Uh, and it was the first shade tree to ever receive a plant patent. This is a marine honey locust that was planted in 1954. I know that I, the date sticks with me. That's what the gentleman said. That's the year I was born. A beautiful tree. Marines are very nice trees. Females love to lay eggs on thornless honey locusts over mimosa, though. That's the later research. And I captured this in a town called Trenton, not too far from where I live. A thornless honey locust, and it happens to be a highly susceptible thornless. And this is a mimosa right there. And you can see, yes, they'll lay eggs on mimosa, but look at the honey locust. There's mimosa. And yes, there are eggs, there are nests, but nothing like the honey locusts. That's because all honey locusts are not equal. The research has shown that fewer eggs are produced by females raised on moraine compared to Imperial Shade Master Sunburst and Skyline. But on the other hand, in terms of, uh, or, uh, well, actually, and in following with that, the least preferred tree in terms of egg laying is also moraine as, a per, as compared to Imperial Shade Master, Sunburst and Skyline and some of the newer introductions. We believe what's happened is moraine was, was found growing wild. It was, not, it was not produced, it was found growing wild. It still had the genetics protecting it against a lot of problems. Probably not this insect because it's non-native, but nonetheless, as we started selecting for other features on honey locusts, unfortunately, we selected away from uh, the ability for the honey locust to protect itself. Apparently, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip ahead here because I want to try to keep this uh, uh, tight, and I want to cover one last thing because this will happen again next year, I'm quite certain, depending on environmental conditions for just two minutes here. This was something that came across my desk, a person sent this to me or highlighted it. And this was a post, a Facebook post by WCPO or Channel 9. Has anyone else seen this strange orange dust? Orange dust, residents of Villa Hills to Florence to Bellevue, that's in Kentucky. I'm saying that for people who are in Ohio or elsewhere, have reported seeing this in their neighborhoods. Now, when I saw this, you know, I thought, oh, that's interesting. Wow, look at that. Now, my background's entomology, but I have some plant pathology, but I knew my plant pathology colleagues would go nuts because what's connect, what is the connection between this orange stuff and calorie pears and eastern red cedar, which is actually a juniper, juniper from Geniana? Well, the connection has to do with an alternating of hosts. The disease is called cedar, even though it's a juniper, quince rust. So these are infections on junipers, on eastern red cedar, but on juniperus virginiana. And you can see this when it's in this gelatinous mass, it's releasing spores. Those will dry down, but still orange, still orange in appearance. So those spores fly over to a rose host. Now, not just calorie pear, a number of different trees in the rosaceous, uh, rosaceae family where it infects the fruit and sometimes will also infect stems, but a lot of um, the fruit is a main target. Of course, these uh, teleal horns that sprout from the fruit give rise to spores that then fly back to juniper. 
alternating, not alternate. This fungus has to have both hosts. It completes part of its life cycle on one, the other part on another. But it, it, the spores that give that uh, rise from the uh, fruit of the calorie pears do not are not capable of reinfecting calorie pears. Same idea with the spores on junipers. So this was quite a challenge. And so here's a big alert. And you can see the shots that I took in the location there. Now, if you look at the amount of fruit on this calorie pear, and I think this is the key for why this strange occurrence happened. You know, originally calorie pears were not supposed to put any, uh, produce any fruit at all, right? The original calorie pears are supposed to be self-sterile. But then, you know, we didn't count on the idea of the hybrids being able to reproduce, by being able to cross. And so we see this tremendous amount of infection on the fruit. And boy, when you hit that, it just looks like, some people call it Cheetos, like Cheeto dust, that's what it looks like. But it's kind of not funny when it's raining down your cars. Look at this. This was uh, no wonder the press uh, was notified of this. Uh, it was quite an interesting thing. So thankfully we were able to help, you know, to tell them what was going on. And, and so it was solved and, and even made national news inside editions online um, version uh, uh, picked up on it. So it was quite an event, but what I want to make sure everybody understands is here's the ingredients for an outbreak. You have to have the eastern red cedars, which we have plenty of eastern red cedars. And if environmental conditions are right, oops, hang on for a second. Let me just do something here very quickly. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain here for a second. Okay, so the second ingredient are calorie pears, which have been planted for the longest time as ornamental pears. Look at this parking lot. It is nothing but calorie pears. Of course, they escaped because we didn't know they were gonna produce fruit. They did produce fruit. This is long I-75. This is about 13 acres of solid pears and none of them were planted. And you can see here, you know, these were not planted. And there were a few planted uh, near the base of so this is actually a little ski slope, believe it or not. Uh, and you can see they're climbing the hill, escaping. And they're producing the fruit, which then can become infected depending on environmental conditions. And then we'll have Cheeto hands again. Well, I'm going to finish up with just this last part. Again, I apologize for uh, going a little long, but knowledge is of two kinds. We know the subject our, ourselves or we know where we can find information on it. So you can go directly to the Beagle website. You can review a lot of what I talked about, but also go there and see all the other challenges. Or you can also sign up for these Beagle alerts. And I'm a little bit over, but we can have some questions now, I think. Did thank everybody, you, Joe. Did uh, everybody leave? You. I thought everybody left. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're all mostly all still in here. So mostly. Again, huge thanks to uh, Lindsay, Bill, and Joe. We're going to turn it over now to a Q&A session. So in the chat room, if you have questions that you want to ask of our panel, feel free to uh, ask questions. We probably have a whole bunch that's already in there. So I'll uh, let uh, our experts start to answer those. As a reminder, we do have ISA credits for tonight and landscape architecture credits. And Josh is gonna share his screen real quickly to show you arborists how to get their credits. So all you need to do is email us the, uh, your ISA certification number. So the email address there on your screen, arboretum, A-R-B-O-R-E-T-U-M, at boonecountyky.org. And we will get those listed up on the uh, signature page that we're all familiar with and get them sent in. Thank you, Josh. We also want to thank everyone that purchased a happy hour basket uh, for this evening. We had quite a few people who did that. And we really hope that you enjoyed your drinks and uh, food tonight. So thanks again to your support, uh, supporting the Arboretum 
and also anyone who also donated to the tree fund through tonight's program. We really thank you for your support of that. Helps us uh, keep new plants coming into the Arboretum um, at a constant rate. So thank you so much. And now we're gonna turn it back over to the panel of experts. Uh, we can stay on here as long as you all want. Um, as long as there's questions, we'll stay on. If you need to head out, thanks again for your participation. Well, I'm looking through the questions um, and I'm looking, uh, whoever wants to take the first one, there's one there for you, Bill, coming down. Yeah, um, I see that one. Um, um, I've heard about certain monotypic species, Osage, Orange, Kentucky coffee tree, pawpaw, uh, rising as a result of the loss of a major megafauna species such as woolly mammoth, uh, which did eat the uh, Osage Orange uh, from the con continental U.S. Do you have any thoughts on this as a mechanism uh, or any theories about how this may conti continue as other seed uh, disappearing fauna become an um, expirated uh, from their native habitats due to human activity or climate change. The avocado is uh, another one uh, that uh, the sloth is thought to have uh, been a major, uh, you know, carrier of the, the seeds around. Anything that can eat an avocado pit and uh, deposit that somewhere else is got to be a, a good sized animal. So these these uh, uh, sloths were about 500 pounds, as I understand. So uh, yes, that is exactly right. Uh, this this is a major way that they get uh, evolved, uh, you know, get spread around. And uh, some of the reason that they are relatively insect and disease free. Uh, I might also add that as far since we've talked a little bit about coevolution tonight, um, the mammals coevolved with the, the larger fruits. And so the, uh, when the fruit is green, it has a lot of uh, tart uh, materials in it that are, make it unpalatable. It also blends in in color with the foliage. But when it turns that bright yellow or bright red color is seen by the mammal, uh, the horse or whatever animal it happens to be will come up and eat the animal. And then the seeds pass out of the, uh, the south end of the northbound horse. Uh, so that is another interesting, uh, you know, point in geologic history and such. Well, I also want to add it, and this was uh, actually mastodons were were the, one of the major feeders on a lot of our our uh, our big fruit. Uh, mastodons have sharp have uh, pointed teeth, um, uh, and 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 they fed on trees. Uh, whereas, you know, mammoths had uh, grinding uh, teeth. So they, they were like washboards. But the, the reason I bring this up, if you go out and look at native honey locusts, and this was pointed out to me by uh, a paleontologist at the Cincinnati Museum of Natural History. I never noticed this. And Bill, you'll, maybe you've noticed that I never had. But if you look at the thorns on honey locusts, they don't start until about four or five feet off the ground. Uh, they start and they, they only are on the tree at about the level where a trunk from a mastodon would be affected. So there are a lot of features about these trees that were shaped by these large mammals. And it's, it's suspected that, that the thornless honey locust that was found in Northwest Ohio, it was suspected that that was a natural occurrence occasionally because apparently the genetics involved in producing those thorns uh, are rather is a rather new feature. Uh, so when trees would occasionally revert to thornless uh, types, they would get you know they'd get uh, taken out by the mastodons. But now that there are no mastodons, you know they can they can survive. There's a, a question in here about calorie uh, pairs, and there may be some misconceptions here. Uh, I think someone said that they're outlawed in Indiana, and I can't speak to that. Ohio. Well, they're not yet outlawed in Ohio. That, that'll be 2023. Yes. But... Um, someone on here said that they are in, I saw it somewhere, uh, that they're, they're, you can't plant, you can't produce them in Indiana. Did I just imagine that? Well, 
Well, I know that was on the uh, list for adding to the prohibited species, um, and, and it was in legislation, and I think it's on the same uh, timeline as what Ohio is. Yeah, yeah. So, it, I mean, it is, that was a nod to the industry. I mean, we had people that had these in their, their fields. So for Ohio, you know, when the new list was created, was when I say new, five or six editions, uh, calorie pairs were on it, but again, they, they deferred for a couple of years. So, you know, if you do see people selling and planting, it's not illegal yet in Ohio. It, it will be though. Well, one of the issues our battles we face is um, the, getting the nursery industry on board. Um, you know, it's about supply and demand. If if people quit asking for them, they'll stop growing them and stop selling them. So that's that's one of the biggest hurdles we have. Well, and I'll share a quick story. It's anecdotal, and I'm not going to give any names, but this was this is exactly what you're saying, Lindsay. So I got an email message from a a, a master gardener uh, here in Cincinnati, and she saw that there was a uh, uh, a UDF, United Dairy Farmers, which you know we have all over um, this part of Ohio, based in Ohio, and they were putting in a new UDF and they were planting calorie pears. So um, she got in touch with me because she thought it was illegal to do so, and of course I said, well, until 2023, it's not. But she took it upon herself to get in contact with the headquarters of UDF to find out why calorie pairs were being specced for their stores. <laughs> and, and Lindsay, lo and behold, they backed off. Once she provided them uh, uh, the uh, Teresa Colley, uh, many of you online may know Teresa. She's head of the biology department at University of Cincinnati. She did the, uh, she did the early research, groundbreaking uh, publications, uh, scientific publications on this problem and uh and and i had shared that with a master gardener and she provided all this and lo and behold like i said they they took it off they 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 didn't plant the trees there and that that went off their list and that's you're exactly right Lindsay. that's the kind of thing that sometimes we don't we should help people understand you know get involved you know don't be uh, you know, don't be tactless about it, obviously. I mean, none of us listening here would be, but the point being is that they get involved and, and, uh, and make people aware. Yeah, one of my colleagues who is listening uh, and participating in this webinar reminded me that um, the Arbor Day Foundation still has ornamental pear featured as a tree on their website. Jeez. Yes. Well, That's... our work is never done. <laughs> <laughs> We're preaching through the choir, I'm sure. <laughs> I'll turn my video back on. I'm sorry. I was. <laughs> so what else do we have on here? Somebody asked a question about uh, control of biological control of uh, the bush honeysuckles. And so over in Asia, and uh, both Eastern Asia as well as Western Asia, where the uh, two bush honeysuckles that we have came from, there would be something that would eat on it. But it is questionable whether we would want to introduce yeah. those particular uh, bugs into uh, this country. So, Yeah, unfortunately, so far, and th there is a fungal uh, blotch disease that you'll see building through the season and you know it's kind of one of those hope springs eternal uh so far that is not proven and Lindsay, you've seen it you know what i'm talking about it's it, it well and bill too you, it can make them look bad and, and and make you wish i mean i actually saw some in a local park that was probably heavy enough infections to to harm the plants but doggone it they, they are just so vibrant in terms of <laughs> regrowth that uh, it didn't take them out. So, uh, so far, I'm not aware of any natural controls and uh, I'm not even aware of things that graze on them. And that's sort of the characteristic of a, a natural pest mm -hmm. is that it, no good parasite is going to completely kill its host. Yeah, yeah. They don't listen to the rules all the time, do they? Yeah. No. What is the status of resistant elm, ash, and chestnut? Well, that's interesting. Yeah, we could all take that. 
Well, the only thing that I'm concerned about with elm, um, you know, it's a, the resistant elms are certainly um, a nice substitute for what we have, but they're an elm is still an elm. It's still very fast growing. It can be weedy. It can have poor branch attachments. And I'm a little concerned about their sustainability as a long-term urban tree. I don't know if you guys have an opinion on that or not. I would agree with that. And we've seen in the, the, the elms were much more popular in the north than in the deep south. And the reason was uh, that the, in the deep south, where they did grow quite well, uh, they were very brittle in the ice storms. And as the climate change occurs and continues to develop, uh, you know, we will see more ice storms in the area where we're all living right now or most of us are, are living right now. Uh, so when I came to Kentucky in uh, 1979, uh, we had a much colder climate in, in those years than we uh, do now. And so now the climate that we have in the Lexington area is equivalent to North Alabama at that time. Well, and to, just to get that the, the, the whole question, um, I agree with what you're saying and what both of you are saying. We do have true American elm. As a matter of fact, you can see one at Spring Grove that unfortunately hasn't been selected yet, but it has to be resistant because it's there and it's huge. And uh, as a matter of fact, I tried to tape it, Bill, and, and, and couldn't even get a, a, a tape around it. It's that big. Mm. Uh, whereas I've watched, I took pictures of, mm. of three American elms where you could throw a baseball from there well, some people could, maybe I can't, uh, close enough till that tree was tested. So we have, I think, what is it now? I think we're up to eight. Uh, the, the latest one uh, was, uh, was out of uh, Minnesota. Uh, but I have to agree, we, we need to always be careful about getting carried away with anything. Even the marine honey locusts I mentioned, I, I hope no one heard me, you know, that I'm saying we want to go back to when honey locusts, because remember, we forget that was one of the first trees that replaced a, uh, elm. And we just planted them all over the place. Uh, so I want to go back to Bill's presentation, you know, uh, making sure we understand we want to have a lot of diversity. The ash situation is being looked at right now. Uh, some of you probably seen what were what became called lingering ash. And there does appear to be some type of tolerance, I'm using the word tolerance, not resistance yet, that could be going on. And that's being pursued by the U.S. Forest Service, the same people that are doing some of the elm work. Chestnut is a problem. I, I, if you talk to the folks that are trying to work towards a chestnut that is more like the true American chestnut, it still has to have a... a uh, you know, enough of the Asian genetics until you end up with a tree that's closer to an Asian, you know, a Chinese chestnut, so-called, uh, and not an American chestnut. But that's the holy grail. Um, but, you know, it is nice that this is, that this is progressing. It's nice that people are looking into these things. Um, there's a question down there. I want to, uh, what, is there a disease killing black walnuts? No. I'm being very blunt about that because uh, the next response was thousand cankers disease. Uh, the good news there is that spread by an insect that is native to southwestern United States and northern Mexico. Uh, the the uh, it's a type of bark beetle. It's called a twig beetle, but it's a type of bark beetle that has a a very that has a high low temperature threshold. And so where we had thousand cankers disease, which is a fungus spread by a beetle, it looked pretty grim. But for the last four to five years, both in Ohio and down in, uh, in Tennessee, in the Knoxville area, where they were losing trees, uh, it's, the beetles have disappeared. Uh, as a matter of fact, there was a grad student down there starting her work on it. And unfortunately, she had to switch to do something different because that's how dramatic it was. So thousand cankers disease, let's take that off the table for now. And uh, the challenge that we have with black walnuts is what we always had with black walnuts. Uh, it does have an anthracnose disease that tends to cause the leaflets and leaves, the compound leaves to drop early in the season, can make them look a little bad. It's very environmental dependent, uh, but, but I've heard people even point to that as being 
an issue, but the leaves are lost so late, it really doesn't appear to cause any harm to the trees. So nothing, I don't, I don't want anybody to leave here and have the idea there's something killing black walnuts. I'm not aware of anything, Lindsay or Bill, I don't let nope. you guys kick in. No, we're on this, I think we're on the same page there from in our camp here in uh, plant pathology at Purdue. And black walnuts always have leaf spots. Uh, they defoliate, they're late to leaf out, they defoliate early, they always have a, a few leaf spots in the fall from what I've seen, so. Yeah, that's the anthracnose, yeah. Hey, um, Joe and, and um, Bill, um, one of my uh, colleagues here, Andrew, uh, can you guys address that um, question regarding the trichoderma uh, treatments? Yeah, um, trichoderma, for anybody that's not familiar with it, is a fungus. Uh, and it is a predatory fungus on other fungi. Yeah. And it, it has, uh, so we always like to see a shark that eats other sharks, <laughs> in other words. Uh, but anyway, trichoderma has been pushed by uh, uh, a number of pathologists uh, as far as a uh, biological control for Ganoderma and uh, Armillaria and several others. Uh, it works, but um, I don't think it's going to live up to the, uh, the great expectations that it, it has been uh, given. So, Well, and I want to go back to what you said earlier. You know, it, this is not something that came out of thin air. I mean, mm -hmm. as, as Bill's noting, you know, it, uh, that genus, I mean, that was discovered happening. But, you know, a successful parasite so you know a parasite on another parasite you know doesn't typically kill its host so just for that reason you know we really do have to kind of factor that in when we look at nat natural controls by the way the same thing applies to the parasitoids for emerald ash borer. i hate to say it but you know we're not going to look for those parasitoids the wasps for example that have been uh, we're not going to look for them to eliminate emerald ash borer it, it may suppress populations a bit, but they will have the greatest impact when we have the highest populations because there's more food for them. So, uh, you know, as much as I would love to see gold, you know, these, these uh, silver bullets that are of a natural uh, orientation, they're very hard to come by. I see Lindsay's wanting to jump in on this. <laughs> well, we released, we released a, 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 a large population of parasitoid wasp in Indianapolis for, in hopes of, uh, of balancing out the predators or the, there with um, emerald ash borer. And it's been a slow, slow process. Yeah. And, and that, and I, don't, I don't want anybody to hear me and imply not to do it. I, I, that's not what I'm saying. I just, I've, just don't expect rapid results. <laughs> rapid results, or I—I th I mean, if I were to put money on something, I would rather put money on this idea that we may have some tolerant trees down the road. Okay, and Lindsay, you made the the comment of it's slow progress, but you're speaking in human terms, right? And really what we need to look at is geologic terms of, uh, you know, in the next 500,000 years, uh, will we have a resistant ash? Well, yes, uh, there will be something that'll mutate. Uh, and so they'll live in happy coexistence with the emerald ash borer, just as the Manchurian ash uh, lives uh, with the emerald ash borer. Well, Bill, and I'll tell you, I, you know, of course, all the people listening are going to say, now, wait a second, I, they're starting to pick up on something. You know, we enjoy talking to each other so much that we may be at, it may be 10 o'clock, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, Bill, it does go, but it does go back. I loved your talk and, and, and how you're connecting to, uh, to deep time. And we use the term deep time, um, geologists use that term. Mm -hmm because it's a time frame like nothing we typically think of. If you're a geologist, I mean, what's a few billion years, frankly? Uh, and I use the word B, because if you're a geologist, you know, that is the, your time frame. Uh, you know, we think in terms of decades being long, right? Or a century or two. We use the word millennia. Well, that's nothing for a geologist. That's like a, a, a blink of the eye. But at one time when all these continents were joined, actually more than one time, many times, uh, these trees were all evolving 
And and Bill, I love that you you brought that up. That is something we tend to forget that a lot of plant evolution occurred on a planet that looked very different than what we have today. So at one time, emerald ash borer, you know, may have its predecessor may have targeted the ash that we have now. And now this is kind of wild, and you know, we call it a non-native on a native, right? But <clears throat> This gets to a question that was asked of me by a master gardener. They asked some of the best questions. And she asked that very question. She said, you know, Joe, maybe at one time, way back, you know, uh, these beetles were testing the ash that we have now. Well, over time, that resistance can be lost if the genes aren't being, aren't imparting any type of a favoritism to the, to the host, you know, they, they may be lost. On the other hand, you know, the genes may still be there and my point being is it may not be by accident that we have these lingering ash. Uh, it may be that the genetics was there. They just, uh, and then wasn't completely lost. And so, you know, that's something to always keep in mind that that's a possibility uh, uh, because, you know, our continents didn't look at it. I, I want to go, uh, Phil brings up, a, I didn't want to mention this, but yeah, he brings up a point that there's an American chestnut that's a GMO and we don't, and I don't know. He's saying the the comment period. Uh, if you go down to talk about SUNY uh, is is releasing it. My understanding is that it might have some great value, but GMOs are are really in the doghouse these days. So I don't know what's going to happen with that. It's an interesting thing that that was done. Did we lose Lindsay? Lindsay had to uh, leave to go head off to help out with his church. So he was, Oh, okay. Was, so. All right. Okay. Well, I suppose probably we've gone long enough. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and there have been many species that have gone extinct in North America, as well as other places in the world. Yeah. And we once had native ginkgos here. We oh, once yeah. had native dawn redwoods. We once had native uh, tree of heaven. And for one reason or another, or perhaps a multitude of reasons, uh, they went extinct in North America. Good stuff. So, kind of I like all we... those planted blue spruce, right, Bill? Yes. <laughs> so, so the uh, uh, Joe, the uh, the ash that that is Asian has the ability to flip on a gene. Yeah, uh, that uh, that makes it resistant or or mute, not immune, but resistant to the emerald ash borer. Our ashes have the same gene, but it's not flipped on, and that's one of the things that they're working on is uh, some way to flip that gene on. Uh, get our something like a white ash or green ash, or the European black uh, to flip on that gene. Well, and somebody asked, can you discuss EAB resistance of blue ash? Uh, you know, the the best way that uh, I ever heard that described was by Dan Herms uh, way back when, uh, when he was our department chair. He did a lot of work with Emerald Ash Borer and worked with Michigan State with Emerald Ash Borer. And uh, I use the same description for, for Asian longhorn beetle when I talk about the different hosts, the preferred hosts as a compared to other hosts. Dan would call green and white ash steak and he'd call blue ash hamburger. And so the resistance uh, of blue ash, which, which, is, which is a chemically oriented resistance, it's definitely there, it's measurable. They know the compounds involved, but it was not enough to totally protect the trees. And so I wanna make sure everybody hears that. Um, what is most enticing are these lingering ash that we're seeing that may, and I'm saying may, because there's always a possibility they were just, they were escapes, but although that seems kind of doubtful now when you look at the, the, the uh, pattern of infestations, but um, those were blue, those were white and green. And, and, and to my knowledge yet, now I'm not sure, I don't hold, nobody hold me to this, but I don't think we're finding blue ash that are lingering, but we probably will but we're not talking about apples to apples on this. Blue ash was always just slightly more resistant and they were some of the last to go, for example, in greater Cincinnati. 
unfortunately they did go i documented this on one location where all the blue ash that i had tagged were taken out uh, which is disappointing but they were after a lot of the other ash had already been taken out and that same analogy of steak and hamburger applies to the uh, fringe tree. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, so, yeah. Well, it's even. So it's, it's not even hamburger. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not even hamburger. So yeah, you know, you're starving to death. Uh, you know, do you want to starve or do you want to eat the the fringe? Yeah. Tree? So. Probably spam. <laughs> well, no, I like spam, so let's not yeah. use that. <laughs> All right. Have we gotten have we gotten through everything? I, I mean, if if somebody really wants to, you can. I mean, you know, you're not prevented from being unmuted. If we're not covering your question, unmute yourself and and speak up. Boy, that did it. Okay, we <laughs> we had a um, a question from Will about finding a species, and he was asking about a specific type of oak. Uh, one of the best places for tree geeks of all sizes uh, and interest is to go on to the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum's website. And the um, if you Google oh, yeah. Anderson, Lord, not know. Anderson, but Anderson, A-N-D-E-R-S-E-N, Horticultural Library, you'll find their plant uh, finder source and you can put in either the common name or a botanical name and they will list the retail and the wholesale nurseries mm -hmm. that handle that particular uh, type of plant and this is true f for everything from annuals and perennials and vegetables all the way up to witties I have a question okay yes Okay, I um, spent the summer and most of the fall, me and my husband did, going back to my childhood home and clearing out probably 15 feet of woods and honeysuckle, mostly honeysuckle came on, came in and just like squished the property line. And so we cleared it out and then I put um, glyphosate or some kind of weed kill on it after we would snip them so they will die and not grow. But I want to plant some other trees in there because the majority of the trees have died because no one took care of the property for the last 45 years and the vines and just the, the, the lack of care. What do you suggest I plant there to make it look beautiful again? There's no maples left. There's no color anymore at all. Wait, where are you? Where's this located? Where is this? Taylor Mill. Okay. Sorry, Bill, I'm, I'm going to defer to you, okay. but I just thought well, I'd better find out where this is for sure. Yeah, it's in yeah. Taylor Mill. So the, uh, the reason that you find uh, monocultures of uh, bush honeysuckle is that it is uh, allelopathic. And the oh. foliage uh, produces a chemical that is toxic to or inhibits the growth of most other plants. Now that you've gotten rid of it, uh, you should be able to plant just about mm -hmm. anything you want. I would recommend just a mixture of different species. Do you need a hedge type uh, planting there? No, I don't need a hedge. I just need it. I just want it to look beautiful again. When I grew up, it was beautiful. We had buckeye trees. We had so many different varieties and the majority of the trees have all died because of the vines going up to the top and killing them. And then, like you said, the honeysuckle. So we've cleared it, and uh, the only thing I did plant for a little bit of a hedging was some Leland cypress, but eh. yeah. yeah, Leland, I, I wouldn't have yeah. done that. I don't oh, really? recommend those in our area. No, yeah, no. Oh. no. They are fairly short-lived. Uh, they do they get stressed by the winter cold temperatures, even yeah. as far as. Uh, you know, the far south is warm as uh, North Carolina and Alabama and Georgia. Uh, and they will, um, I'm drawing a blank on the name, uh, mm. Joe, uh, the canker. Oh, oh. ceridium. Yeah. Canker. Uh, well, yeah. Is that oh, okay. it? Um, but anyway, they will develop a, a canker on the foliage and then you mm. lose that, that screen. Oh, that's um, not good. Okay. So what would you re uh, recommend there instead? Well, be, before you go, Bill, just a little bit of a, a thing. I'm going to share a screen here because uh, because this is what's nice about Zoom. Can can you see my screen with plant places? Mm -hmm. mm, it's blurred. Yes. Give it a few. Is it okay? Is, 
Okay, it's not blurred now. No, it's still blurred. Oh, Cause I'll snap a picture of it if I see it. Cause right. I, I'm, I'm new to this whole plants. Oh, there it goes. Well, okay. Gonna, okay, so it's slow, very, very slow. Yeah. Okay, so Plant Places is produced, uh, <laughs> that was started by Steve Fultz at the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden. And it was started originally for our region, but Ooh. it's expanded now to include other areas. But, but um, I mean, Bill and I could go, we, we could really be at this for quite a while recommending things. Yeah. But on the other hand, uh, what Steve has done is, is he doesn't put trees in here that aren't tried and true, meaning that, that he has every good reason to believe they will do well here. Mm. And so I would go to, I would use this and, and make your selections from this and do what Bill said, you know, just have fun with some diversity. The last thing though, that you really want to make sure that you, uh, that you pay close attention to is the mature size of these trees, because we often, you know, get carried away, you know, some are going to grow slower than others, but eventually, you know, you're going to want to have some big trees there. And they can be so big that they'll undo in the future, maybe not our lifetime, but what's going to happen there. So the point being is this, this really provides a place for you to make the decision on what you would like to have. Okay. Um, thank you. And, and yeah, you wouldn't see the Lilland <clears throat> Cypress on here. Oh, okay. I didn't and, know that. <laughs> and if you'll look at the chat, Mary Ann has graciously added the, uh, the extension office number, the Kenton County extension office number, and oh. said that she would send you a list of native plants. Uh, while you're at it, um, look up the the book um, Trees and Shrubs of Kentucky by Wharton and Barber. Uh, that has a, a really good list of, of native plants. And what I describe my own yard as sometimes is a plant zoo. I've got like the Cincinnati Zoo. I've got yeah. one or two of as many things as I can cram in there. Mm. Uh, so, uh, so that's the species diversity. Uh, so, my my camellia, my hardy camellia, is in bloom right now, and I'm really enjoying it. And here it is, the end of November. Um, and so they, there's usually something of interest out there. Uh, I've got a. Uh, we live on a, a small lot, um, you know, it's a fifth of an acre. Uh, it's not even a full quarter acre, but uh, I've got a, uh, a pevy minaret, uh, bald cypress out there. And it's a smaller bald cypress uh, than the full size one. It's a dwarf form, uh, but I was looking at it today and it's about um, uh, 25 feet tall or maybe even cl a little closer to 30 feet tall. It's, been in the ground for the last 22 years uh and it was uh, you know fair size when i got it uh but it it uh, adds interest all all uh, season long mm. so. well i i hate to do this but i'm gonna have to jump off now so okay uh, <laughs> joe, joe before you go can i ask or make one quick statement here sure. yes uh, and bill you may be able to answer then it, if Will's still on, he was actually asking in the wild if there was some place where this particular oak tree or maybe the type of environment that oak tree could be found. Hmm. I don't know. I was, uh, I. The, it was a oak hybrid. I believe he was looking for it. That would be very Lena. difficult. Yeah. In the wild? He, he said in the wild. He said he had found one in Butler County. So if it's a hybrid, that's kind of strange. <laughs> yeah, I, we we speak I about know. the oaks as being very promiscuous, <laughs> yeah. and and yeah. they they cross pollinate with each other. Yeah, um, and so you'll find uh, bur oaks and white oaks even uh, crossing with each other. Um, that explains yeah. why I have trouble identifying the. Acorns that I picked oh, up. Absolutely. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There, there are what is it, a hundred and sixty different species of oaks that are identified in North America. Yeah, the U.S. Forest Service has a very nice publication on oaks. 
yeah. it also does a nice job for me when I travel down south with oh, the live yeah. oaks. It doesn't show. There, up. Oh, there it is. Yeah, that's it. That's that's very nice. Yes, and uh, and it it probably does the nicest job of helping with. But as I mean, I you know people that really know oaks and Bill really knows oaks, and you get out in the you get out with them. Uh, by the way, Steve Foltz at the zoo knows oaks, and occasionally you run across one, and it's like, well, uh, that one's been, uh, you know, that's that's been one that's created behind the woodshed. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, is there a lead author? Bill, is there a lead author on that USDA publication? Yes, this is a. I've got it as a book, and it, it, I've got the a virtual background. I was trying to get that off, but. Uh, the, I've got it as the book form, and you can find this still online as a used copy. It's called Field Guide to Native Oak Species of Eastern North America. And uh, it's the publication number is, and I will uh, read this off slowly, F as in Fox, H as in Hilo, T as in Tom. E as in elephant, T as in Tom, dash 2003-01. And so it's a USDA publication. It's available free online. Yep, I was just going to show people that. Okay. So some of you, obviously, uh, if you have a slow, uh, if you know, those with faster load times, you'll see a clear image. Some might have a problem, but... If you do, if you just simply uh, type in, if you just Google uh, field guide to native oak, uh, as, as a matter of fact, Google filled the, the rest of it in. When I said field guide to native oak, uh, it it filled the rest of it in, and there it is. If you can see this uh, online, mm -hmm. and um, I, I'm like Bill, I have a I have a hard copy, but this is so nice to be able to get this uh, online copy as well so beautiful thank you yeah yeah it's a it's a good one it's a very helpful i'm gonna have to go everyone this has been thank fantastic thank you chris and josh and bill thank and thank everyone you, Joe. yeah thank you bill okay yeah and if anyone needs to look at trees you can always walk around in the arboreta in the area especially the boone county arboretum we got everything labeled and you can learn plants there and see what does well in our area at the arboretum and you can donate and you can donate. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to get that in there. All right, everybody. Bye-bye. Good, good night, Joe. Have good night. Bye-bye. Thank Stay you. Safe.